<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, hello everyone and welcome to day four of this fantastic Yali 10 Summit. We have had a full and packed summit uh, over the last few days. And more importantly, we have felt the energy, the Yali energy coming from all of you every single day from across all regions and all corners of the African continent, but also from key stakeholders and supporters of Yali here in the United States. And I know that today is going to be more of the same of that uh, energy. So I'm excited for your uh, engagement and we're looking forward uh, to having you engage in this first pl plenary session of the day. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, my name is Manda Muyangwa and I am the director of the Africa program here at the Wilson Center. And I'll be your moderator for this session this morning. I welcome you all to this keynote session of the day focused on US-Africa relations, consolidating progress, addressing challenges, and fostering opportunity. The connections between the United States and Africa go back several hundred years. They have evolved over the years. And in this session, we want to focus on the current state of US-Africa relations and how we might continue to work to consolidate uh, the progress. There's some really good stuff that's going on within our engagement in this country with the continent. We want to talk about some of the challenges uh, that we face within that construct, but also talk about how we can foster even more opportunity uh, to really strengthen that bond between the United States and Africa, to develop these mutually beneficial relations that benefit both the United States and Africa. More importantly, we want to discuss how you, the youth, fit into that larger construct of US-Africa relations. See how we can center you even more since you are the future of the continent. You are the future of international and global relations. So this really promises to be a fantastic session and we have three excellent speakers who will speak to these issues from a US and an African perspective. We have asked each of them to offer initial remarks of six minutes and after all three of them have spoken, we will launch into a Q&A with you, the participants. So, Without taking up too much of their time, let me now introduce our speakers uh, for this morning. We will first hear from Ms. Elizabeth Fitzsimmons, who is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, class of Minister Counselor, and the Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of African Affairs. Since 2018, she has served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Central Africa and Public Diplomacy. She was previously the Acting Deputy Spokesperson for the Department of State. In 2009, she was named a fellow by the International Women's Forum, one of only 25 women in the world to be so honored. Ms. Fitzsimmons, welcome to you. Our second speaker today will be Ms. Maria Price Detheridge, who is USAID's Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Africa Bureau with a portfolio that includes executive level oversight and management for US aid programs in Angola, Botswana, Comoros, Eswatini, Lesotho, Madagascar, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and the Southern African Regional Program. She also has administrative management of the full Africa Bureau. Prior to joining USAID, she served in several key senior leadership positions at the Health and Human Services Agency here in the United States government. Our third speaker will be Ms. Ohafi Mampane, who is counsel at the South African Consulate General in South Africa, responsible for political and trade affairs. She served as the Assistant Director Central Africa at the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, working with Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Sao Tome, and Principe. She has served as Vice Counsel at the South African Consulate General in Munich, Germany, and she is a former chairperson of the Mandela Washington Fellowship Southern African Regional Advisory Board. And she brings that YALI uh, perspective as well as a perspective uh, as an official um, working within an African government. So we're excited for this session. And with that, let me turn it over to our first speaker, Ms. Fitzsimmons, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Monde, for that wonderful introduction. I am delighted to be here with all of you. And I think it's a real testament to YALI, the energy that you can feel even in a virtual event. 
I know we're all looking forward to getting back together in person, but I really thank the Wilson Center, our partner, and of course my fellow panelists. And I want to just note here, we talk a lot about mantles these days and panels that are exclusively men. I think this is pretty amazing that we have a panel of exclusively women and um, except for me, all women of color. So I think that says something really powerful about the connections and the energy around Yali that we're able to attract this kind of talent to be involved. And of course, to have Maria and Ohalfi here as my colleagues, it's just really exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing from them and I know you will be too. I really can't think of two better people to help examine the opportunities and the challenges for US engagement with Africa or a better audience. Yali is the future. You Yali alumni are some of the truly most impressive young people in the world. And I'm honored whenever I get the chance to connect with you. You've heard from others throughout this event that Africa is a priority for the Biden-Harris administration. So if you take nothing else away from what I say today, please know that Africa and US-Africa relations are a priority for the Biden-Harris administration. As we seek to expand the US-Africa relationship, we're already starting from a strong foundation. And the fact that we have this event with all of you here and 10 years of YALI already behind us, that's a testament to that strong foundation. America has a long-standing, unwavering commitment to the continent, and no country in the world can match the depth or the breadth of America's long engagement with the people of Africa. Our relationship has evolved over the decades to become one of cooperation, mutual respect and transparency, and it's guided by the following core principles. First, we work with our African partners to strengthen democracy, foster good governance, and support human rights. Second, we seek to promote trade and business ties between the United States and the countries of Africa developing partnerships that create dynamic opportunities for the people of both regions. Third, we look to harness the potential of Africa's youth population, of all of you, to drive its economic growth and to create real lasting prosperity. Fourth, we work to advance peace and security across the continent, because without peace, it is impossible to have sustained economic development. And fifth, we invest in people and institutions like all of you and like YALI through funding for health, education, humanitarian assistance, and the development of a robust and active civil society. And it goes without saying that after more than a year of confronting the COVID-19 pandemic glo globally, that we now face real and increased challenges in pursuing those five goals. We're all mourning the loss of friends and of loved ones, of lives upended and of livelihoods destroyed. There's no doubt that COVID-19 has dealt the globe and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa a very tough blow with the region entering a recession for the first time in 25 years in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. That's why we're committed to working with African governments, with your governments, with the US private sector and international financial institutions to help return African economies as they were prior to the pandemic to some of the fastest growing in the world. I would also be remiss if I didn't raise the other pressing crisis facing our planet, and you all know that better than I do, climate change. As President Biden has emphasized since he took office, every nation has a responsibility and every nation is at risk we must take global action on an unprecedented scale to confront this global challenge. The United States has a shared interest in Africa's sustainable development, and we want to be partners in creating climate-friendly trade that secures good livelihoods for both African and American workers. It's clear that as we look to Africa's future, your future, its political, economic, and social landscape will be shaped by its young people, by all of you participating in this summit. As I always remind audiences who know less about Sub-Saharan Africa, it is the continent of the future with a population of 1.3 billion people whose median age is 19 years old. African youth are one of the continents and the planet's most powerful resources 
to drive and foster prosperity and ingenuity. Your generation is as plugged in as your counterparts anywhere in the world. And of course, the impact of Africa's youth tsunami will only increase as we see Africa double its population by 2050. So this presents tremendous opportunities and huge challenges. Your generation is going to look to your governments to respect democracy and human rights while also creating jobs and opportunity. As you know, YALI is the US government's signature initiative to engage the next generation of leaders across Sub-Saharan Africa, and it is and will remain a key element of the Biden-Harris administration's efforts to harness the potential of Africa's youth. For the past decade, YALI has promoted leadership, effective public administration, and strengthened civil society by facilitating lasting connections between participants and between their peers in the United States and Africa. What is clear to me whenever I have the privilege and the honor to sit down and speak with YALI alumni is that you represent a diverse and a truly remarkable group. Your CEOs, your entrepreneurs creating jobs, your civil servants guiding organizations, your journalists defending freedom of speech, and your doctors and scientists promoting health and well being and driving scientific breakthroughs that will prevent future pandemics. I've seen deep dedication in the YALI alumni that I've met. You want to build your countries and you want to turn the challenges of demographics into opportunities for your countries. Dollar for dollar, the past 10 years have proven that YALI is one of the best programs we have ever devised to build capacity and build emerging leadership in Africa. And I'm truly excited to see what the next 10 years will bring. My dream is that when we sit down for YALI 20, which I hope we'll be able to do in person, that we will be talking about a brand with the kind of global recognition that the Fulbright brand has today throughout the world. The future is limitless, and I am really excited to walk into it hand in hand with all of you. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna pass the microphone to my colleague, Maria, and I really look forward to our discussion today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Um, it is really, really an honor and a pleasure to to join you this 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 morning and this afternoon, and it's a pleasure to just have the opportunity to to share with you today. Um, to the host of this event, the State Department and the Wilson Center, thank you for inviting me to engage in this very important dialogue around the US-Africa relationship. I'm excited to be a part of this YALI 10 year anniversary celebration. And I look forward to sharing some of the perspectives from the United States Lead Development Agency, the US Agency for International Development, also known as USAID. A big thank you also to the USAID and the State Department staff for their hard work in supporting YALI and supporting this event. And finally, thanks goes out to our African university host institutions and staff who implement YALI regional leadership centers, as well as IREC staff and the staff of the Mandela Washington Fellows Partner Institutes who implement YALI. And to my fellow panelists and Yali alum, who you'll hear from next, uh, Ohafi, welcome. And finally, a very special greetings to our online community, the thousands of alumni and Yali Network members listening in, and to all assembled, welcome. I echo Elizabeth's comments, and I affirm that the United States is committed to a prosperous, peaceful and democratic Africa. At USAID, we partner with African countries in pursuit of shared interests and values from security and global health and climate change to freedom and democracy to prosperity for everyone. And this includes populations that have been historically marginalized. But we want to put youth at the forefront of these priorities to drive change throughout the continent. Later today, you'll hear from YALI alumna Flavia Kulelu from, uh, 
Flavia Kaleli Nabagabi, who was a strong proponent of democracy in Uganda and who advocated for fair and peaceful elections. At a Mandela Washington Fellows Conference in 2019, Flavia announced her Yalasi legacy would be serving someday as a woman member of parliament. And yes, earlier this year, she accomplished that goal and was elected as a member of Uganda's parliament. She's also the leader of the Women's League for the National Unity Platform. And she has just demonstrated tremendous successes as a result of her engagement in Yali and her ability to network and, and use her, her skills. Leaders like Flavia used youth activism to address longstanding issues. She called on her peers and other young leaders to use their voices to address democratic concerns and propose solutions. The US government sees global health as a priority in Africa. And USAID is the leading partner in countries' response to pandemics and infectious disease outbreaks such as COVID-19, Ebola, and HIV, HIV AIDS. We support programs to end preventable child and maternal deaths, to provide humanitarian life-saving assistance such as emergency food, safe drinking water, shelter, basic education, and protection for millions of people. Our partners in these efforts are African youth who respond to health crises like what we saw during the COVID-19 epidemic. For an example, Yali alumni in Guinea came together under the Alumni Association to develop hand washing kits for distribution to essential workers, which effectively reduced the risk of infection for over 9,000 people. In another effort, Yali alumnus Bonte Karu of the DRC made a video in French Sign Language to teach the public about the symptoms and prevention measures of COVID-19. So we need people who can envision and design solutions that are greater than all of us. And this is true also for climate change. This, this generation of youth will be disproportionately affected by climate change for decades to come, but all of you can and are making a difference to improve your environment. Yali alumni Ineza Grace from Uganda started a networking platform for youth working on environment issues. And she now helps people, young people, organize local community projects to address pressing climate matters. We also need partners like Adeyoke Lasisi in Nigeria, who's addressing waste management by converting textiles and plastic waste into eco-friendly products. And this is why investing in programs like YALI is so important. Through YALI, we have seen firsthand how the entrepreneurial spirit of young leaders across the continent can create jobs and opportunities for others. According to a recent survey from our YALI Regional Leadership Center in East Africa, an estimated 60% of their alumni report owning a business following their YALI training. Each of these businesses generate an average of almost three jobs. And among the Just Women alumni, this statistic is even higher. Confident, engaged young people bring fresh ideas and innovative solutions to challenges. And you all help to create a more employable workforce with greater buying power. You help to stabilize and advance your communities with transparent public management practices and a vibrant civil society. And you help to address global challenges such as climate change, securing access to education and health crisis. So I'll, I'll end here by just simply saying, Thank you. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your dedication. And thank you for your commitment. Back over to you, Mondi. Thank you so much. So we've had two really powerful 
overarching but also detailed um, presentation on how the U.S. engages with Africa, the U.S. commitment to Africa, the key focus areas in terms of that engagement and the role of youth within U.S.-Africa relations. Let's now turn it over to uh, Yali alumni and um, a South African government uh, official, Ms. Alfie Mampane, to give us that African perspective. Uh, Ms. Mampane, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Monde. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very honored to be here this morning, um, being a panel member together with Elizabeth and Maria, and I could not stop smiling just listening to them speak, how they echoed my entire presentation this morning, and I, it made sense why we ended up in the same panel. But with that said, I'm really honored to be here this morning to represent such a remarkable network of young African leaders. And I really do hope that I'll do them justice because they are really a true, the true um, epitome of what Africa needs and what African leadership should be about. It is very fitting that we are here today to commemorate 10 years of the YALI initiative, exactly one year after the commencement of the UN Decade of Action, a period that calls for transformative solutions in economics, social and environmental issues. The Young African Leaders Initiative is an investment in and an evident recognition of the next generation of African leaders, which serves as a suitable platform and network to utilize for achieving the sustainable development goals. As we draw close to 2030, there is no time like the present for us to come together as a collective to support and promote intergenerational dialogue as a building block to addressing the complex global issues that we are faced with, those that we as young people will have to contend with. Now more than ever, we need to advance global leadership, ramp up cumulative efforts that will draw on the experience and expertise of governments, the private sector, civil society, and of course the brilliance and deafness of young people, both in the US and on the African continent which would be best realized through exchanges. 2030 can certainly be a very monumental year for the world and especially for Africa. It is the year set out to achieve the SDGs in a year where Africa's youth population is expected to make up 42% of the world's population, making it the youngest continent in the world. It is therefore imperative that we ensure this youth bulk is effectively harnessed to generate dividends for the continent and ultimately the world. To achieve this, we need to amplify and recognize the importance of agile governance, education, skills development, economic prosperity, gender equality, youth leadership, innovation for social impact, international market access, equal access to opportunities, food security, peace and security, along, of course, the value and the role of global partnerships. What are the obvious challenges that we face? Africa is not always in the lead. We need to ensure active participation and inclusion of Africa in any and all discussions about Africa's future, its opportunities and challenges. Any discourse on Africa should be led by Africans and fundamentally should include the voice of young people who are often at grassroots levels working hard to solve for these. Second to this is the challenge of developing meaningful and sustainable partnerships. If we are to forge meaningful partnerships, we ought to ensure that the concerns of the continent are treated with the same importance, not only in our bilateral relations, but also at global level, echoing the impact climate change, health and security, the energy crisis, water and food scarcity will have on Africa and equally advocating for decisions that support the goals of Africa. Another challenge we are faced with is persisting global inequality. There is massive global inequality that exists. And this is seen in access to resources such as clean water, reliable energy, food, and education. We need to ensure that every child, irrespective of their place of birth, has an equal chance to quality life, opportunity, and success. What are the opportunities, you may ask? Of course, while the onus does not rest solely on the US, there's an opportunity for the United States, which has already laid a foundation to take the lead and show what role developed countries can play 
in making sure Africa is not intentionally or by design left behind. We can achieve this by creating collective and shared value. There are opportunities for us to collectively create shared value, ecosystems that optimize business value chains and help scale social impact in initiatives to reach as many people as possible on the continent and drive the change we want to see. In addition, in the age of new technology, what better way than to support initiatives by young innovators on the continent, which would directly help Africa leapfrog into the fourth industrial revolution, ensuring our active participation in international markets. We may also look into favorable trade relations. The US has an opportunity to continue its deliberate efforts to address trade challenges faced by exporters from Africa through tailored trade engagements similar to the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, which would substantially improve market access into the US, especially for products by young people, presenting also a huge trade partner for the US. Consideration for currency fluctuations is also important as it has a bearing on operational overheads which impact the, st the stability and sustainability of small medium enterprises. Trade remains a very critical and sustainable economic development practice and growth plan for Africa. We ought to remember the cornerstone of YALI and its flagship program, the Mandela Washington Fellowship, to harness the skills of young Africans who have already shown leadership in the spaces they occupy, to sustain their participation through active involvement, and to create spaces that would allow young people to pull up chairs at decision-making tables. These will serve as critical contributions to the development of future continental and global leaders. Thank you. Fantastic. I, I love that. Uh, I think you, you spoke directly to the issues. You've given us some um, uh, issues to engage with. You talked about um, the strength of the US-Africa relation, but you also talked about some opportunities to strengthen that even more as well as some focus areas from an African as well as a youth perspective. Uh, with that, I'm now going to open it up to uh, Q&A, uh, but before I do that, uh, let me just very quickly uh, give a shout out to some of the people who are engaging from across the African continent. Uh, Precious Azomene, we see you. Zuha Panchu, we see you. Alion Dia, we see you. Catherine Nairuba, Sikota Balikon, Emmy, Alice, Emmy Allison, and uh, Maurice Awuko. So keep engaging, keep engaging. This is fantastic. This is your session. We want to hear your, your voices. And with that, let me open it up. We have a question actually from the very last person I gave a, a shout out to, which is what systems are uh, in place in data and knowledge management that can help in smooth transitioning when leaders change. This is because each new change disrupts the already established relations and in turn affects progress opportunities and sometimes introduces new challenges. So this is all about you know, the, the leadership transitions uh, on the continent and sometimes even here in the US and how that impacts uh, the relationships and the foundations that are already in place. So what systems uh, do we have in place to better manage that, to ensure the continuity, uh, to minimize the disruption, and to ensure that we can continue to build on the strengths uh, of the relationship, both at the continental level, but also at the bilateral level. So let me start with you, uh, Elizabeth, and then I'll, I'll, I'll circle um, uh, to Ms. Dethridge and then to uh, to you, uh, Hafi, to give us a response on that. So over to you, Ms. Fitzsimmons. Thanks so much, Dr. Monde. Um, I'm going to be very interested to hear what Al Hafi has to say about this as a new diplomatic colleague. But from my perspective, with a quarter of a century at the State Department, and um, that kind of blows me away when I think about that, that I've been a diplomat for over 25 years. But I think in the United States, the system that we have in place to ensure that kind of relationship continuity is actually our foreign and civil service. The fact that our State Department, even when there is a transition of, of administration, has structures in place in every part of the State Department, whether it's the regional part working on Africa, 
whether it's the ocean environment and science part, working now on climate change, whether it is uh, our information technology structure, all of those pieces have long-term civil and foreign servants who remain with the organization apolitically to ensure continuity when there is change. And of course, that then has the follow-on effect of making sure that we don't lose relationships institutionally or personally in sub-Saharan Africa on the continent. And diplomats really, and, and I, I don't want to leave Maria out here at all. And of course, by diplomats, I'm also including my development professional colleagues because we work hand in glove. Um, those relationships, again, institutionally and with individuals transcend politics. And I think that is one of the true strengths of the American diplomatic, military and development nexus is that we have professionals in each of those organizations who continue to serve so that we don't lose relationships when we have a change of administration. Obviously, we see a different focus. The Biden-Harris administration has turned a real spotlight on Africa. That is exciting. It's tremendous to be a part of. So we're going to see growth, I think, in all of the areas where we're working together. We're obviously also seeing a renewed and incredibly important focus on climate change. But we aren't starting from zero because, as I said, we have this system of relationships. So I, I'll turn it over now to, to Maria and Ohalfi to share their perspectives. Thank you. And I'll be really short because I really want to hear from Ohafi as well. And I'll just say this, um, with the systems that we have in place with our, our diplomats to include our development professionals, um, a key piece of that is early engagement. And we see that with every change of administration, the early engagement with, with host countries and, and getting to know the new leadership and the new administration. And that helps us to reinforce the strong relationships that we have with our, with our host countries. I, and I, I think it's no secret that by helping societies protect the basic rights of citizens and, and, and making sure that that is part of our engagement, part of our re-infusion that um, we help to prevent conflict, we help to spur economic growth and advance human dignity. And this is all a part of reaffirming the relationship and reaffirming the U.S. priorities and reaffirming the priorities of our host country and making sure that when possible we have alignment and we're synced. And we know that countries with democratic freedoms are just more just, more peaceful and more stable. And so having those conversations and reinforcing that message is really important because it allows the citizens to really fulfill the potential and to advance our shared vision of a prosperous and a resilient continent. And with that, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Ohafi. So over to you, Ohafi. Thank you so much, Maria and Elizabeth. Um, I really think the very foundation of civil service is having a well-oiled machine that will continue to run um, irrespective of the changes that take place within the system. And I think what we've gotten right in South Africa is exactly that. But in addition to that, there's been a deliberate effort to invest in young um, South Africans that are looking to enter um, the diplomatic environment. And that also speaks directly to what I shared in, in, in my remark that intergenerational dialogue, the inclusion of young people is very important to pass on the baton. That way they also start learning from the civil servants that are already in the system who understand how things work and then bring in their own skills and their own style of working. But I think that is what has enabled us to continue working despite the changes in governance. Let me go back to something that um, Ohafi, you raised. Uh, when you were talking about some of the challenges, and I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here, but I know you're pretty agile, so I know you'll be able to uh, give us some really um, great uh, responses. But I want to make this a forward-leaning uh, discussion. You talked about some of the challenges, and in challenges, I always think also lies opportunity, right? So the question I have for you is one of the challenges that you talked about is elevating um, African agency on issues, Africa's agency and voice on issues that matter to the continent, ensuring that Africa is on the lead 
uh, on issues that really impact Africans um, on a day-to-day -day basis, on issues that are going to shape the continent for the future. So if you were to identify maybe one or two concrete areas where we can sort of step back and revisit so that we can work together, the United States and Africa, to make sure that African, uh, African agency is elevated, that African voice is elevated. What would those issues be from your perspective? And what are some of the concrete actions that can be taken to ensure that that comes to fruition? Thank you so much, Dr. Monday. I think as I was listening to you speak, the first thing that came to mind was education. I think that is a fundamental point of departure. Without education, you're not able to elevate your population to any level of understanding or even pursuit. So education is one chat is, is a big challenge that we are faced with on the African continent. And I think that should be the first level of our partnership where we sort of start building on opportunities. Um, second to that would be and I say this very cautiously because while gender equality is very important, I think equality is also very, very important. You also don't want to, to find yourself in a situation where you're constantly just pushing young girls above of young boys, considering the fact that when we look at Africans um, and the legacy of the continent, the impact is not only on young women, but it's on the entire population. So you also need to manage how you, you advance equality for young girls, but at the same time, make sure that you bring the young men also on board. But I think what the opportunities are or where we could start is looking at education exchanges. And this could be two ways. It shouldn't just be with um, Af young Africans coming to study in, in, in the US or having exchanges with American students. It could also be American students going onto the African continent and understanding the nuances, understanding the situation, understanding the challenges that we are faced with. We also have to consider the fact that these young Americans are also future leaders. And if they are able to interact with the realities of the challenges on the continent, they will be better, uh, better placed to come up that speak directly to the challenges that we face. But then um, going back to the issue of gender equality, having more women representation, having more um, people of color, having um, people who are considered to be disabled, we need to have representation. There is nothing more important than people seeing themselves through the eyes of the people that represent them and having them advocate their, the challenges that they face understanding how best to address those issues and those challenges. Those are the many opportunities that we can actually start building on from the onset. I don't know if either Ms. Fitzsimmons or Ms. Dethridge has, has, have a response or something to add on to uh, the three key points that uh, Ohafi just mentioned on uh, the education, uh, in quality and also ensuring that American youth enhance their own knowledge and uh, interaction uh, with, with, with Africa so that we can continue to build this relationship uh, from both ends. So let me start with you, uh, Ms. Dathroy, just in a minute, if you can respond uh, to one of the issues and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Fitzsimmons. Sure, I'll just simply say this, and this is a saying that we hear over and over again when we're talking about empowerment and supporting um, various communities and particularly communities that have been historically marginalized. And that is nothing for us without us. And so as we're having this conversation about how we can partner to um, ad advance the three prongs that Ohafi mentioned, education, equality, and, 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 and the other inclusion piece, inclusion at the table, with significant decision-making, we have to make sure that we're not making decisions without the people who are impacted by the decisions. And we have to make sure that we are aligning in a way that includes not only a visual representation, but a true representation in the dialogue. I, um, I love I loved the the notion that we you know, need to build on and continue to expand exchange education opportunities. Um, it, it's, it's no secret that if we elevate one portion of the population 
and forget the other portion of the population, then the entire population is severely hampered by that that gap. And, and so closing the disparities, but making sure that we maintain balance is, is really critical. Uh, over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks. I'll just say that um, I entirely endorse everything Ohafi said. It really needs to be also about exchange, right? You talked about the fact that it can't just be one way young Africans visiting the United States. We need to create a consistent pipeline of true exchange. I'm really delighted that we have set up over the last three years the University Partnerships Initiative, which is exactly designed to do that, to have American researchers, African researchers working together, both in the United States and in African laboratories on issues of mutual concern. I think we need to grow programs like that. I'm also really, I love African proverbs, and I'm always really reminded that of the proverb that instruction in young people is like engraving in stone. And uh, I think the education point can't be overstated. It needs to start at the very earliest stages of life and continue through. I think honestly, uh, we've focused maybe too much in the United States on high school and college exchange. I really want us to see how we can bring younger people, which also of course brings family units into the dialogue because the decisions, particularly on climate that are being made now affect not only the young people of today, but the young people of tomorrow. A number of questions coming in, and I'm gonna turn this to uh, my American colleagues on this question. Uh, the question is, what can the US learn from African youth? I, I think sometimes there's this tendency to think it's a one-way uh, relationship. Uh, but truly, I think at the heart of this question is that we learn from each other. So specifically, the question is, what can the U.S. learn from uh, you, uh, from African youth and how can we uh, embed that into the way we interact with, uh, with the continent, whether at the bilateral or multilateral uh, level? So over to you, Ms. Fitzsimmons, and then I'll come to Ms. Dethridge. Well, I'm going to turn it back on your questioner and say, what can't we learn from African <laughs> youth? Uh, I really actually think, and I, I know that sounds like a flip answer, and I don't mean it to at all. It expresses my heartfelt, genuine belief that when we meet each other with humanity, as our, with our common humanity in front, that the potential for exchange is limitless. So I see the limiting factor not as what we can learn from each other, but how can we create more opportunities for that learning to take place? Because I'm a diplomat, right? I'm a great believer in the last three feet that, that the time you spend actually engaged with someone with an open mind and an open heart, that's where breakthrough happens. So I would encourage all of you listening to think about um, everything that you possess that you can share with others to improve the situation in your country, in your uh, on your continent, and where you can bring value to the globe. So I wouldn't be limited by what you think has been shared in the past. The future is yours, and all the knowledge and experience you possess is exactly what we should be exchanging. I'll stop there and turn it over to Maria. And I'll just say that um, we have so much to learn. We have been learning from our youth and we continue to learn and we need to continue to create this space again for youth to be at the table so we can continue to learn. Um, the examples that I provided earlier represent proof of the immense potential of youth to make deep and meaningful differences in the improvement of their communities and the livelihood and well-being of communities. And so I mean, even just with YALI, with the more than 24,000 YALI alumni and the 700,000 YALI network members, your collective power is really awe-inspiring. Um, and, and, and so I would say, you know, as, as, as we continue to create opportunities for you to have seats at the table, embracing and engaging youth as key partners in, in, in development of the communities, um, it means that you are pivotal drivers of change and of transformation. And, and driver, the word driver is a key word. Too often our youth are viewed as risk to society or problems to overcome. And, and that ignores the fact that the young people are ready to make remarkable contributions to their communities. And all of you possess incredible potential 
to be problem solvers of today, not just the future. And so, yes, we have tons to learn from you. You know, I would be remiss in not asking Ohafi what she thinks uh, the U.S. can learn from African youth. So in about a minute, I have a couple of other uh, interesting questions that have come through. So in about a minute or so, Ohafi, what, what's your perspective on this question? What can the U.S. learn from African youth? Thank you so much, Dr. Mande. I think there, there is a lot. You can't, I can't overstate really the importance of people-to-people -people exchanges. That is the crux of learning more about a person and what makes them tick. Um, and I think there's so much more that the U.S. can learn from the, the African youth or from Africa. And part of it includes resilience, um, hard work, hunger, desire, and just a need to want to be the difference. There's just so much that I could say um, about what the, there is to learn, but I think that could also be built on by our relationship as we continue to grow um, in our U.S.-Africa relationship, there will be a lot of other opportunities to see where the U.S. could actually tap into their own resources um, and learn and also grow their own societies to actually better serve the African continent. Fantastic. So there's one question I need to get to. As a moderator for the summit, I've been seeing this question come up in various guises. We are running out of time, so I'm going to ask you each to just spend a minute uh, responding to this question. The question is, there is a lot of good stuff that the United States uh, is doing in terms of its engagement with Africa. But one of the areas that many young people are frustrated with and concerned about is the democratic backsliding uh, that we are seeing in some countries of, on, on the continent. And that it doesn't really matter how much you invest in youth. It doesn't really matter how much you invest in all of these other things. If that governance landscape is not right, that's an investment that's going into a black hole, basically. It's not going to have the sort of impact that we are looking at, looking for. So what can the United States do? First of all, is the United States investing enough in terms of supporting the people on the African continent who are working for uh, good governance and democracy? What else can the United States do uh, to help facilitate Obviously, Africans own that agenda for good governance, but how can the United States play a more um, a, a role that actually helps, facilitates, adds value to what Africans are already doing in terms of trying to arrest that democratic backsliding? So just in a minute uh, to each of you, and, and, and this time, let me start with you, Ohafi, and then I'll roll around uh, to Ms. Detheridge and then Ms. Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Dr. Mond. I was hoping you wouldn't start with me. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very complex one. Um, but I think before I respond to what the U.S. can do, I think it's very important for us to also understand that the responsibility lies extensively on us um, as, as citizens of the continent. And the way I think of it is if you have a problem at home, before you invite any external players to come in and solve it for you, you need to look at what resources you, you have at play or what you can do to resolve the challenges that you have. And when we talk about good governance, that is exactly what we need to do. We need to use the instruments that we have at play, whether it is the African Union, with um, whatever institutions we have on the continent, and also bring together the, the skills, the might, the knowledge of young Africans to say, how did you achieve that in your country? What is it that you are doing in your region that is promoting good governance? And how can we as a collective make sure that we echo these sentiments within our governance? Um, in addition to that, young people also need to not tire from constantly demanding certain levels of good governance, but more importantly, ensuring participation at all levels of governance from local to national um, and to, 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 to regional. Ms. Dethridge, you're next. Sure. I, I would say that the way that USAID enters this space is um, the things that we do to help ensure a strong civil society, um, making sure that we support um, education and, and good health and, and good economic um, growth and stability. And those things 
gird a stronger civil society. And so we um, enter this in, in our support of growth of enterprises that both serve as buyers and suppliers of U.S. businesses while fueling the kind of job creation that gives rise to real economic growth and political stability across the continent. Um, it, it, it then helps civil society to, to engage more confidently, um, training around uh, de democratic uh, society. Um, we, we're proud to participate in the whole of government. Um, one of the initiatives is the Prosper Africa Initiative that makes opportunities more visible to um, both American and African businesses as investors. And, and again, the things that we do in this space, in the space of health, in the space of education, in the space of humanitarian assistance, those things we believe help to um, build a stronger civil society that can engage and will engage um, in holding governments accountable for decisions, for policies, for laws, et cetera. Over to you, Elizabeth quick pieces, two quick thoughts. The first is we acknowledge every day and must do so that our own union is imperfect and that we ourselves talk openly about the challenges of democracy, healthy democracy, full democracy, and that we acknowledge the existing inequalities in our own society. As we are transparent and honest about that, I think that grows the potential for others to also be. I think also to echo what Ohafi said, African solutions for African problems, we need to support the African Union, um, sub-regional groupings like uh, SADC and others to uh, themselves come up with common solutions to common problems. And I think that's where we'll see uh, the potential for uh, greater progress in this area. Uh, let me give you each just 30 seconds, a word of inspiration from you to African youth listening across the continent. What would be your 30 seconds of inspiration be? Your message of inspiration. So again, I'll start with you, uh, Ms. Fitzsimmons, come to Ms. Detheridge, and I'll allow um, Ms. Mampane to have the last word on this one, and then we'll bring it to a close. So over to you. I'll share the Ashanti proverb, you must act as if it is impossible to fail. And with that, I'll just simply say the future belongs to Africa's youth. So, so many of the world's most powerful movements have been fueled by young people. And that's why YALI is transformational. My advice to you today is to never stop seeking new opportunities to grow and learn. You're here because you took a chance on a leadership opportunity and it paid off. The world needs diverse young leaders like you to collaborate with each other, especially across borders, ethnicities, and social economic class. Together, we can build a better future for generations to come. I salute you. Uh, oh, Hafi, bring us home, please. What's your <laughs> word of inspiration? And I will definitely do so. From the first day of the session, it always seems impossible until it's done. I believe that the baton has now been passed on to us and it's our responsibility to run with it. Thank you. Fantastic. This has been a, a great session and I can't thank our speakers enough. Uh, we have heard about the U.S. commitment uh, to Africa. That remains steadfast. We have heard about the Biden-Harris uh, administration really elevating Africa in terms of its foreign policy engagement. That came through loudly and strongly. We have heard about the anchors of U.S. engagement with the African continent across the social, economic, political, and, uh, and uh, other spheres. That came across very strongly uh, as well. We heard from um, our African speaker about areas, really homework that I felt for the U.S. to think about in terms of what can we do uh, differently? What are the areas where we can allow Africa to lead? How can we work with Africans to ensure that their agency and their voice comes through strongly? We heard about the importance of amplifying young voices. We're already doing a lot in that regard through YALI and other programs. Is there more we can do to really consolidate um, African youth's uh, contributions to the continent as the drivers of Africa's uh, future and its transformation? To think about that, to think about the 
partnerships that we have with the continent? How do we uh, create those partnerships uh, that should be uh, allow Africa to play a critical role that are mutually beneficial partners, partnerships that came through very strongly. The issue about how we share and interact in the global commons also came uh, out uh, in terms of global resources, allocation and access uh, to uh, global resources, that that should be fair. If we, if the United States uh, wins and Africa wins, then everybody wins. Uh, I think that was the, the key message. But from all of our speakers, what I heard this uh, today is that we cannot have strong U.S.-Africa relations. We cannot have sustainable long-term uh, U.S.-Africa relations without centering youth and considering across a range of relations and interactions how youth fit into that. And so with that, please join me in thanking our three speakers for this morning for a fantastic job. Thank you uh, so much. I have just a couple of announcements to make as we transition uh, into the next session. Uh, this week, we've talked about Yali's impact over the last 10 years, and we showed uh, a little video showcasing some of our Yali alumni speaking to how Yali has impacted them, their communities, and their countries. And I thought those were really powerful uh, personal statements on what Yali has done and how Yali uh, is contributing to the continent and to individual professional growth. Today, we are talking about US-Africa relations. So right after this, we're gonna have a short video montage that will play featuring American and African officials as well as private citizens talking about why YALI matters to the United States and to Africa. And you will see that it reinforces many of the points that were made by our speakers uh, this morning. Right after that, we're gonna have another video, entertainment video, um, featuring two African artists, again, continuing to celebrate our YALI alumni uh, in the creative sector, especially given the theme of this year's Africa Day. I think that's really, really important. And third, uh, for many of you, we hope you're going to stay around for the expo, which will start after that second entertainment video. And with that, I wanna introduce um, a YALI alum, Ms. Adepeju Jayoba, a 2014 Mandela Washington Fellow and YALI Advisory Council member to just provide a brief introduction to the expo and what you can uh, expect to see at the expo uh, this afternoon. Uh, Peju is a lawyer, a social entrepreneur and a youth advocate with more than 11 years of experience in policy aggregation, policy writing, maternal and child health issues. Uh, Peju, let me turn it over to you for your quick introduction to the Expo and what our participants can expect to see at the Expo this afternoon. Thank you very much, Monday. Good afternoon from Nigeria, everyone. Um, it's been a wonderful session today. Thank you so much um, for joining us. So today at the Yali Expo, we've got very exciting things for you to see. Everything you're thinking about, everything you plan to think about in advance. I mean, we have it all in the Expo. And I'm dead serious about this. Are you looking to start a radio station? We got you in the expo. Are you looking to just read books? We have you covered. Are you looking to just sit on the sofa, get your credit card, and just keep swiping as you shop around the continent? We are waiting for you on the other end of the expo. So today we'll be hosting the expo, and um, the expo will start at 9.40 um, ED Eastern Time, which is um, in a few minutes, I think, now. And then... We would encourage you to um, visit all the booths. We encourage you to look around and continue to shop and interact with all our partners and everybody at the Expo. At the Expo. So we have um, businesses, we have institutes, we have um, different startups also. We have, I mean, even if you're looking to start a university studies, I mean, we have you covered. Seriously, we have you covered. I mean, you're looking for research partners. We are right there in the Expo waiting for you. I mean, so when you see me at the Expo, just say hi, come swipe your cards in my booth, come chat with me and things like that. Um, so we have the Hip Africa. We have um, Africa Regional Services. We have um, the DIY Entertainment. We have the Youth Cafe. We also have the youth-led USAID team all in the Expo waiting for you. Don't forget that during the Expo, I mean, you can have live conversations and live chats with um, each booth, especially those having um, Zoom booths open. You can also um, have the live video conferencing for the booths. Um, 
you have live chat you, all you have to do is just click on the top left hand side of your screen and then you'll be right there into the expo room we hope that you would have exciting time with us today we are looking forward to seeing everyone um we are ready we want to see the power of connection we want to see the power of relationship building we want to see the power of unity we want to seal and feed the and feel the power of the yali network the yali expo is open and we are ready for business welcome all right thank you thank you so much that was fantastic if you do not show up in the expo i don't know what's gonna get you there so <laughs> we look forward to seeing you in the expo uh thank you peju for now let's roll uh the tape on why yali matters to the united states and to africa thank you so much uh to our speakers <laughs>